If you look at the commissioning ceremony of the Navy's unmanned ship, I looked at the picture a fair while and called up the program manager and said to him, what is that circular donut-shaped thing I see hanging in the middle there? Is that a life preserver? To which he said, yes. And I said, why does an unmanned ship have a life preserver? And his answer, he was, he was very thoughtful about it. Uh, his answer was, yes, we were aware that this was strange, but there's a Coast Guard regulation that requires that every ship have a life preserver. And I said, did you try and get a waiver? He said, yes, we did, but we quickly concluded it'd be easier to hang a life preserver on the ship than get a waiver. In this second crossover edition of China Talk and Acquisition Talk, Richard Danzig, former Secretary of the Navy and currently a senior fellow at John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, talks to us about a series of papers APL commissioned on U.S. China Tech. So we'll get to satellites and EDA tools in a second, but first I want to take it back to pre-Gandhi colonial policy and contract law. So what lessons do these two fields have for U.S.-China relations? <laughs> I think one of the things you learn in contract law is that there's one way of thinking about the world which is transactional, and there's another way of thinking about the world which is relational. In a transactional world, you care only about the individual transactions. For example, when you go to the gas station and buy gas, you don't think you necessarily are developing a relationship with the proprietor of the gas station. It's a one-shot deal, and you might buy the gas somewhere else some other time. When you have a relationship with somebody, as for example, uh, he or she is a supplier to you and uh, you're a manufacturer, then it's not just about the individual transaction because you're going to be doing a lot of other transaction. And that changes a lot of things that you do. And in the context of the Johns Hopkins paper that, that you mentioned, one of the points that my co-author and I make, uh, co-author Loran Lasky, is that you have to think about the broader relationship and not simply treat any individual transaction as the be-all and end-all. You can't dissociate your particular judgment about Huawei from your general feelings, not only about technology, but even more broadly about trade, and even more broadly about how China and the United States manage to coexist in a future world. I think there really probably is some influence uh, from my background in that regard. But we can't shoehorn in the 1920s. No, I can shoehorn in the 1920s. Just felt a little bit of hesitancy about how much you wanted me to go into my ancient history here. But I did get a doctorate from Oxford and wrote a thesis on the rise of Gandhi. And the thing that interested me about Gandhi was his political side, the way in which alongside his moral and larger messages. He also was a consummate politician. For example, he wasn't a high caste Brahmin, and the high caste Brahmins dominated the party politics of the independence movement. But as a lower caste, he brought in outsiders like Muslims and others. You could argue that, I think I would argue, that Xi Jinping has got a variety of domestic political imperatives and his larger ideology and approach to the world is very much affected by the realities of those politics, just as Gandhi was affected by the reality of those politics. And of course, I think the same thing is true of Trump and even the president-elect, who we tend to think of in more idealistic terms. I think there is an intimate connection, not only between different transactions to form a relationship, but also between the domestic political imperatives and the international imperatives. And if you'd like to talk about my junior high school time, I can do that as well. <laughs> we'll save that to the yeah, second half of the show. Know. So Richard, one of the themes that you and Lauren talk about is to what extent the Cold War does and should inform America's framing of the U.S.-China relationships. And one of the main points you focus on is that in contrast to our time with the USSR, major war isn't really on the horizon. So two questions following out from that. First off, what do you think the relationship is between aggressive decoupling policies and the risks of war? Do you want to ask your second question as well? Oh, sure. So the second one was like, if you had, you know, say an 80% degree of confidence that she was going to invade Taiwan in the next five years, how would your recommendations on all this stuff change? Yeah. First of all, when we talk about the risk of war, we're really talking about the near-term horizon. And I do worry about that risk 
but I think it's a risk which is going to be more substantial in the decades to come than in the 2020s. I do think there's some risk in the 2020s, and no one can confidently predict about warfare. So we better be prepared in the most immediate as well as in the longer term. But I do think your sense of probabilities influences your judgments, and that's well illustrated by your second question. Because if we thought we were likely going to war with China in the next few years, for example, over Taiwan, which is the most obvious hotspot, then you would take a much more draconian view than the U.S. public is now taking and the U.S. government is now taking. For example, we are all the time supplying China with semiconductors that are less high end than the, some of the things we're restricting. But those semiconductors are going into equipment, among other places, that the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, uses. If we really thought we were on the verge of going to war, we wouldn't be allowing that kind of shipment. And we would be restricting China in a number of other ways, supply of oil and other kinds of things. So I think the implicit premise, and Lorraine and I say this in the paper, is that we're not going to war in the near term, or at any rate, that's improbable, and we're not taking actions accordingly in that direction. Over the longer term, and this comes to your first question, uh, a sense that we might conceivably come to that kind of conflict, or that we would need to deter that kind of conflict by making it evident to China that there wasn't any advantage to military activity, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. That longer term would, I think, uh, warrant the kinds of measures that we now see being taken in terms of trying to restrict the high-end development of, to stay with my example, semiconductors. The differentiation between the Chinese space program and our space program, where we basically try not to support it and indeed to encourage others not to use it, that's an example along with the semiconductors of how the long-term possibility of conflict changes our export policy. So I think both are relevant, and our present policy seems to me to be proceeding on the assumption that there is a long-term risk, but that the near-term risk is low. And I think that's, by and large, uh, the right way to look at it. China, they publicly state that they want their military to be kind of world-class peer power by 2050. And that feels an awful long way off. And in some respects, it seems like they could get there much faster. Do you think that's what kind of keeps the risk low in the near term, their perceived delay in getting to a peer power? Or do you think that they'll get there faster and that's just talk for us in the West? First of all, Eric, your observation that 2050 seems a long way off shows that you're not Chinese. Chinese are uh, often uh, commented on as having, taking a longer term view. And I do think that culturally and politically, they do take a longer term view. I think maybe Western views of China place less emphasis than I would on the fact that 2049 is the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. And I think for Xi Jinping and others in China, that's an important date symbolically and psychologically and politically. And therefore, setting a target like 2050 isn't just a round number in mid-century. It has particular resonance and connection with this. And I think the long-term risk is higher because of the 2049 possibilities, uh, 2049 anniversary. I think the desire to reach resolution about China may run stronger in China. I think in the near term, stability, probably in the long term as well, it derives in part from the sense that the U.S. can bring overwhelming power to bear. And I do think it's an important deterrent in the near term. And I think the question is, can we maintain that over the longer term? The other question is, can we build some relationship with China that works and that's stabilizing? And the third key part of this is, I think, is there some prospect that with more time, China becomes less totalitarian rather than more, that it liberalizes and that the world post Xi Jinping in China is much better from the standpoint of global uh, peace and cooperation than it has been in recent years.
Yeah, I mean, the dream of a liberalizing China is one that seems dead as long as, you know, she is still around to me. But, you know, who knows what the future will hold. I did find it interesting that your paper makes the often underappreciated point that it's not just the U.S. that over-indexes on the Cold War. It's China, too. You know, she you know, often in his speeches, he talks about uh, Liang Dan. ECN, like uh, two bombs in one satellite, it's these great leaps that the you know Chinese scientists made in the Cultural Revolution and talking about how they need to tighten our belts and Chukwu and understand that we're in a sort of global struggle. This sort of like warping power of the influence of the second half of the 20th century isn't just something that the U.S. has to contend with. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. There is, we're all hugely affected by the psychology of the past and particularly the past that we've grown up with. Xi Jinping is unusual because he was so directly and adversely affected by the Cultural Revolution that you can imagine that he would react against that and stand for the opposite kind of values. But he was also completely immersed in his upbringing in the teachings of Mao. And that mindset seems to be dominant in his own activities. So that's just an individual reflection of a larger societal phenomenon, which is that China, like the United States, is very affected by its views in its past. One of the things you highlight in this paper is the idea that it's the relationship stupid. And what I found surprising was the lack of an emphasis on the relationship with U.S. allies. In general, you're seeing more and more talk about you know, a D10 tech alliance, and it seemed to me a running theme in these papers that a more aggressive disengagement strategy makes sense in a lot of different contracts so long as the U.S. can get its major allies to go along with it. And, you know, given China's actions towards Australia, if it continues down this line, that is probably a much easier thing to assume than maybe, you know, six or 12 months ago. So what's in general your take on the push for these alliances and and how should the U.S. think about what extent it should be willing to push, cajole its, you know, most trusted partners into reconsidering their relationships with China? You asked at the outset about the Cold War analogy. One thing that was striking in the Cold War vis-a-vis the Soviet Union was that At the end of World War II, the U.S. had half the world's GDP, essentially uh, the only intact scientific establishment and industrial establishment emerging from that war, augmented, of course, by the immigration from Europe of key scientists. In that sense, we didn't really depend on our allies as heavily. We needed to rally them, but we could call them to. We're still a hugely preeminent power, 25% of the GDP. But partly as a result of the success of our policies and the end of the Cold War, a lot of other nations have technical capabilities and wealth and uh, significance uh, to contribute. China and the Soviet Union is on a trajectory to potentially be wealthier than us by many calculuses that will occur in the course of the later part of this decade. If it's uh, 1.4 billion Chinese and 365 million Americans in conflict with one another, and China is richer in GDP than the U.S., that's not a completely comfortable situation for us. If it's China versus the world, though, and we bring to bear our allies, the equation looks extremely different and vastly more attractive. So we need, fundamentally, those alliance relationships. And you said, talked about pushing towards that alliance. I think it has to be a seductive and collaborative process. You can't get your allies to line up in the way that you do by pulling on a rope. It's more like pushing on a rope, and realistically, you need different kinds of techniques for doing that. I thought, Jordan, a rope analogy might appeal to you. How does that framework kind of pair with what we've seen over the past you know, 18 months with more and more countries you know, decide that Huawei 5G wasn't right for them. Should the Trump administration get any credit for ringing the alarm bells on this? Or was it more just exogenous, which led to that change? I would give the Trump administration pretty good, although not perfect, marks for diagnosis and terrible marks for prescription. The marks are pretty good because I think they came to grips with some of the challenges associated with China in a way that is useful and uh, I'm not, a, like many people, not a fan of the Trump administration. But that doesn't mean that they're always wrong. In this case, I think they were largely right. I only give them pretty good marks, though, because 
they tended to be very erratic in what they looked at and not very strategic in thinking the whole thing through. Um, jumping from ZTE to Huawei to TikTok is a strange progression and doesn't set the priorities in any kind of clear way. And then the whole TikTok deal had the kind of smell of crony capitalism with Trump favoring certain companies and wanting to get things done in a very individualized and targeted way and giving CTE a pass after it was decided that CTE yeah. had done wrong is really not good policy. So then on the prescriptive side, those are some of the failings. But in addition, as your question implies, it was a very poor job of pushing the rope, of persuading the allies you know, to work with us, of explaining our rationale, getting things lined up so that it was a cohesive thing. The Trump administration has historically been very bad at this, and they manifested that deficiency in this context as well. So you write that 21st century governments are uniquely ill-suited to play a central role containing or redirecting the flow of commercial technology. What are the implications of that statement? I don't really know. I'm struggling with that myself. It seems to me, Good answer. <laughs> it seems to me we can call a spade without knowing how to play it. The problem is, I think, that the technologies are complex and sophisticated and opaque, and the expertise associated with them lies dominantly in the private sector. So if you're into, to come back to our earlier examples of semiconductors in space, uh, especially with semiconductors, if you're trying to regulate them, the companies you're trying to regulate will know a lot more than you do. And the result is that you're going to make blunders that they'll scream about because you're naive. And at the same time, you're going to not see things that they see that are going to enable them, even when they're patriotic, to soften the effect of what you're doing or circumvent it. So you need to bring into government a large amount of expertise. And in a way, your companies are like your allies. You need to recognize that they need to be nurtured and persuaded, not simply directed, uh, because... They just have a key part of the puzzle that you can't monopolize. But that's easier to preach than it is to practice. And I observe that it's easier for me to diagnose this problem than it is to come up with a good way of dealing with it. It seems that, at least in the Department of Defense, we've lost a lot of the technical in-house talent, especially in the 90s era that used to reside there. But I thought it was interesting what you were saying, that the governments are actually ill-suited to redirecting commercial technology. Does that kind of mean that we in the U.S. overestimate the continuing success of China? Because it seems like they have been able to, through the government and its partnership with industry, drive AI and ML, quantum, blockchain, space, and a lot more. So how do you see that vision or that view of the world in, in terms of China relative to the U.S.? Well, there are two parts to what you're saying. Let me just spend a moment on the first part before coming to the question at the end. You're absolutely right that our capabilities in these arenas, uh, for example, in the Department of Defense, are probably less than they were in the 20th century. I say probably only because I'm aware that having lived through some of that history in the 20th century, I may be excessively nostalgic about it. it Maybe that we tend to put a gloss on the past because we filter out the noise, of all the errors and so forth in, in the past. But there's a substantive change that underlies this, which emphasizes your point. When Bill Perry and others began to uh, make a push from the Department of Defense for investment in the U.S. semiconductor industry and bring it along as a key part of the defense establishment, the Department of Defense essentially dominated the market for semiconductors in key years. Over 80% of all the semiconductors at the high end that were produced were sold to the Department of Defense. Now that number is something like 2%. So the market power inherent in that situation is no longer there. And with that loss of market power comes a loss of, of expertise as well as leverage. Uh, on the China side, I think you're basically pointing accurately to a difference between the U.S. and China. That is the degree to which China attempts to control the economy and technology development from the center as compared with our decentralized private sector-led kind of model. 
I note, though, that the, uh, this difference is exaggerated, I think, because it's so vibrantly clear. Rhetorically, both countries are in very different places. But the reality is that the Chinese generate significant private sector investment and initiative, as, for example, with companies like uh, Huawei and Alibaba and Baidu, uh, Tencent. Uh, so there is an important extent to which the Chinese economy is, in fact, privatized, notwithstanding all the rhetoric. And in the United States, we know that essentially DARPA and NASA and other entities in the U.S. government seeded and shaped many of the key technology developments. I've just talked about how dominant the U.S. Department of Defense was in the development of the semiconductor industry, the development of the Internet, the variety of space investments. We all celebrate SpaceX and so forth. But these companies were founded essentially by ex-NASA people, and they're funded by NASA and nurtured by NASA, and that's the dominant market. So I don't want to overstate the difference between them. Finally, though, coming back to your basic point, there are enough differences that it's still a significant point. And I think a real weakness for China and for Xi Jinping's policy in particular is their support of state-owned enterprises. There have been studies that suggest that the return on capital in state-owned enterprises is notably less than in private enterprises. They're quite inefficient. The processes are highly politicized. And uh, that's a weakness in the Chinese system. And we gain some uh, advantage from our emphasis on the private sector. We gain another big advantage from the fact that, by and large, the Chinese aren't successful at attracting immigrants. And if you put aside the foolishnesses of the Trump years, uh, foolishness probably understates it, there's a huge advantage there that we, we could realize better, and I hope we will in the coming years. What similarities do you see between U.S. primes and Chinese state-owned enterprises? And how should the government direct them in a different way or foster new innovation in this space? Well, I think a big problem for the United States is that though our prime producers, uh, contractors uh, for DOD and the intelligence establishment and NASA definitely innovate and have substantial degrees of technological expertise, they have large incentives to nurture their platform business and keep the traditional activities running. And that then allies with a strand inside the Pentagon, which is very real, which is we've nurtured our military professionals with a strong sense of community and dedication to their service. And they're very connected to their platforms as definitions of their service. Tactical aircraft in the Air Force, carriers in the Navy, troop counts in the Marine Corps, it's not a platform, but uh, and in the Army, tanks and other enterprises. So the net effect from, from that is that you get a, a coalition that resists traumatic change. And I'm afraid we suffer from that. We need more dramatic change than we're getting. And I think a big question for the Biden administration is, can they lead the Pentagon in ways that are energetic and cutting edge enough and politically astute enough and imaginative enough to achieve that transformation? Otherwise, coming back to your questions earlier about Taiwan and deterrence, you can imagine a world where the Chinese military becomes so much more technically sophisticated than ours 10, 20 years from now, that we no longer deter them because they're obvious winners. Yeah, I want to jump in here with a quote from Elting Morrison that, quote, military organizations are societies built around and upon the prevailing weapon systems. Intuitively and quite correctly, the military man, and I think you would also probably put the primes in here too who relate to this, the military man feels that a change in weapon portends to a change in the arrangements of his society. I think what you were talking about there, about the ability to move from those weapon systems, a lot of the people are so fixated on weapon systems. Just in the last few years, you've been seeing this kind of trend towards new and emerging technologies. But there's a lot of pushback, not only in the building, but from Congress as well. And so I think a major assumption that potentially I have is that 
I think that China seems to be much more risk tolerant of this kind of experimentation with new technologies. And potentially that comes from their huge transformation over the last 30 years. So they're just more used to that kind of transformation. But do you think that first, China is more risk tolerant of this kind of experimentation? And two, how could the U.S. try to match that risk taking? Just to tempt others in regard to this, the, an observer notes that after the British in the early 20th century are firing off guns, there's a three second pause while people stand at attention nearby. And he asks what that's for. And he's told, well, that's for holding the horses. I think it is quite a compelling anecdote. And I agree with you, Eric, it's quite a good book. I love the notion, by the way, of quoting me and Elting Morrison. I'm delighted to be coupled with him. Basic problem, I think, is that you're very much a professional as a military officer, and it's a profession which has extraordinary strengths, commitment to each individual officer, to his men and to other officers, her men and other officers. It's, it's a wonderful thing to behold. And the degree of training in the American military and commitment to service is a model for the world. Having said that, we're all victims of our virtues. Our strengths become our weaknesses. And I think those commitments tend towards stability and control, but not towards innovation. If you spend time, for example, with Navy officers, as of course I have, you find that if, for example, I'm an EA-6B pilot, my first instinct is on any proposal to think about the world of EA-6B pilots and what the impact will be on my community. And I will try and make arguments that look like abstract arguments, but are in fact, though they're talking about China, I'm filtering in my mind through what is the impact of this on justifying my platform and the like. So getting to change in that regard is very important. For me, there are several different ways to do it, none of them magic bullets, but one is to try and get people out of their particular community and other kinds of assignments, either functionally, I think things like the joint staff are useful in that way, or even just in terms of their work environments. I put a lot of emphasis when I was Navy Secretary and Undersecretary on getting the Marine Corps and the Navy closer together so they would cross-fertilize one another. In a different paper, a paper for Johns Hopkins Applied Physical Ed, also called Preface to Strategy, we have an appendix on innovation. And one of the things that I recommended in that paper, written with a number of co-authors, is that when we promote to three and four stars, we ought to particularly look for this quality of innovation. And one example of how to do it is that a quote from one of the early Trump backers, Peter Thiel, as an entrepreneur in uh, Silicon Valley, had a question when he interviewed people, which I thought was a good one. It was, what do you believe that's important that your peers don't, that distinguishes you from them? I'd ask that question of potential three and four star promotees, not only for the answer, but also for the message it sends. That that's what you care, one of the things you care about. How, how about the, the Chinese kind of tolerance for experimentation? How do you see that, the other side of that coin? Yeah, I'm glad you remind me of that. Well, I feel a little bit about this the way I feel about, I talked about my recollections of the 90s and the 80s. We filter out the noise. So my assumption is that it's extremely difficult for the Chinese to innovate also, that people in the PLA also have their particular platforms, their particular constituencies and the like. The Chinese have one big advantage and one big disadvantage, maybe two big advantages. One is that they see themselves as behind, so they're inclined to change. That's always helpful if you're ahead. There's this old line, nothing succeeds like success. My view is nothing seduces like success, and we risk that production. It's always number two who's more aggressive than number one. The other advantage the Chinese have is that they are subject to a greater degree of command control because it's a totalitarian centralized system. When Xi Jinping says do X, the likelihood that X happens is much higher than if Joe Biden says do X or Donald Trump says do X. So those are their advantages. Their disadvantage is that because it's a totalitarian system, there'll be all kinds of deception practiced by people lower down 
Uh, and they won't provide the correct information to the decision maker if they think it's unattractive to him. They don't want to give him bad news. I just was reading last night a little bit of a history of World War II. Comment, they commented there about the great problem the Germans had because nobody wanted to bring bad news to Hitler. That was distortive. And one example just of how it translates down is that they had some opportunities on the Eastern Front to proceed by giving up territory to the Russians, sucking the Russians forward with their to where their lines of supply would be too extended and their large numbers would work to their disadvantage and then surrounding them in, in an enveloping attack. But nobody could propose that to Hitler without severe danger because it involved giving up territory and he was very opposed to that. So we have many instances in the U.S. where the military, even very recent instances, gives unwanted advice to senior leaders but that's the strength of the system, and the Chinese are going to suffer from lacking that. So let's pivot to the Navy, because you were the SECNAV from 98 to uh, 2001. And back then, back around like 2000, there was a big debate about whether the U.S. Navy needed to grow the fleet to 350 combat ships. And that never really came to fruition, but the goal came back up a few years ago. And now the Navy actually wants to add another 150 or so unmanned vessels to that combat fleet, bringing it up to about 500 manned and unmanned ships by 2045. And the big name around that is Battle Force 2045. So if you were SecNav again, in what way would you try to influence this plan towards 500 ships? In your extensive researches into my ancient history, even though they didn't get back to my junior high school times, you may have noticed that uh, I never articulated a goal of a particular number of ships. And I regard it as not productive, sometimes counterproductive, largely unproductive, simply. The, the numbers are a slogan, but they detract from the key issues of the quality, the degree of modernization, the degree of innovation, your tactical innovation and strategic innovation as well. And they focus people on budget wars and numbers of platforms when the numbers themselves are just not good indicators of capability. Then also people fly these banners, but the banners involve projections out over many years, as you say, 2045. There is no serious control over those out years. And so people fight extraordinary battles over something that is completely illusory. What is our goal for 2030? One of the things that you do as Secretary of the Navy is the Marine Corps particularly asks for a list of books you recommend as a reading list for officers, and partly because it appealed to my puckish instincts, but partly because it, I thought, really would be beneficial. I gave them a list of 10 books, but they were all novels. And my point was you can learn a lot about the world from the standpoint of a fiction writer who's in other people's heads in a way that you can't even learn from biographies, et cetera. But somebody said to me, have you ever tried to write fiction yourself? And my answer to that was, yes, of course, the Navy five-year plan. The Navy loves sending over the 30-year shipbuilding plan to Congress. And you, I always thought that very similarly. And back in 2000, you were saying, what's not target 350 ships is not the number. You said we should invest in R&D, which I thought was very interesting at that time. But more recently, you said, the Navy has its 30-year shipbuilding plan. I always feel like the military is trying to forecast out far too long. But you said, due to uncertainty, the military should build more for the short term. So what were you thinking there? What do you mean by build for the short term? Well, another thing, as long as we're quoting my ancient works here, another thing that, that I put out some time ago is called Driving in the Dark, 10 Propositions About Prediction. And uh, it argued that we developed, McNamara particularly developed this BPBS system, et cetera. And over time, we've focused it to, we've got a scenario, that scenario in the Cold War was Russians invading across the plains of central Germany. And we'll measure our programs against that. And that, as a manager, has big attraction because now I have some kind of anvil against which I can hammer out programs or some measuring stick by which I can assess competing things. Um, but it is illusory. We did a lot of other things. You couldn't, you didn't really want submarines if you were fighting the 
plains of central Germany, but the reality is we built submarines and thank God we did. So it preaches a theory of, of organization that I think is not really accurate. In terms of building for the short term, because I have a high time discount, because I argue that we are driving in the dark and our headlights carry us only X distance, and the further out we go, the less certain it is, I'm much more inclined to put an emphasis on near-term stuff, but to build it in ways that are adaptable, have maximum kind of adaptability to different circumstances. Let me build uh, submarines where I can adapt the firing tubes in ways that can be used for conventional weapons or nuclear weapons and build a submarine in ways that enable me to use it as a vehicle for surveillance or as an opportunity for releasing squads from the submarine that can do small-scale warfare. All those things are difficult to do, and they run into a whole lot of things, including counter-proliferation arms control agreements. But I want that kind of thing. I don't want to design my tanks to be so dependent on fuel farms in eastern Germany that when I move them to Iraq, I have major problems. Just as I should be able to switch the camouflage, so I also want to be able to switch some of their characteristics. And it costs me more to design in that way. But because I know that I'm not optimizing against a particular scenario, but instead against a range of uncertainties, I'm going to build quite differently. And I put more emphasis on the near term than I do on theories about the longer term. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you uh, brought up my favorite punching bag, the PBBE and McNamara. But that brings in the budgetary reality to the programming. And so I just want to get your view real quick. Which is better for countering China right now, if you had to make the decision within a budget constraint? Shifting to accelerating technology change and going to unmanned vessels for the Navy or continuing to grow the conventional fleet potentially at the expense of that R&D? Well, between the two choices as against the present path, I would like to see the present path moving more towards the first thing you said, moving towards acceptance of unmanned ships and the like. But I, it's not just R&D. You have to change the values of the service and the way in which it functions. If you look at the commissioning ceremony of the Navy's unmanned ship, it's an impressive event and there are a number of big wigs on board and so on. I looked at the picture a fair while and called up the program manager and said to him, uh, really nice event, great achievement to get out the ship. What is that circular donut-shaped thing I see hanging in the middle there? Is that a life preserver? To which he said, yes. And I said, why does an unmanned ship have a life preserver? And his answer, he was, he was very thoughtful about it. Uh, his answer was, yes, we were aware that this was strange, but there's a Coast Guard regulation that requires that every ship have a life preserver. And I said, did you try and get a waiver? He said, yes, we did, but we quickly concluded it'd be easier to hang a life preserver on the ship than get a waiver. So I think that story is indicative of the challenges. It wasn't that this guy wasn't thoughtful and so on. It's just, if you're going to start to get the institution to move in the direction you describe, Eric, you're going to have a lot of challenges on route. And it isn't just a question of preaching it. And then to come back to the discussion about R&D and the like, I've increasingly come to the view that the R&D can be a substitute for the real change. It's a good thing to do. I like it. But what people tend to do is if I'm in the military, it's easy for me to say we ought to have more R&D. We just throw money at this. That doesn't force me to change, to give up my platform or whatever. Somebody's out there working on it and it's measurable, and there's an R&D establishment that likes it because they're doing it, they're funded by it. And meantime, I'm not facing the hard question, which is how much do I alter my methods of operation and really, for example, embrace unmanned ships? So that to me is the key issue. Yeah, this gets back to one of Jordan and my talking points about the, the difference between basic and applied. And you seem to have come down on the side that in order to speed the absorption of technologies, we need to focus on the application of systems. So I think what you're talking about is right, and we see that a lot in the Department of Defense. We experiment in this R&D phase, and then we never really bridge that valley of death 
and have these continuous exercises where you're bringing the regular force structure to experiment with these things. It's kind of like we did in the 30s in the interwar Navy with battleships and carriers. Can you just talk a little bit about the difference between basic and applied research and where you think the government program should come down on that? Should they be focusing at the front end or should they really be taking what exists and really applying it in a concerted way and putting that into the force structure sooner rather than later? I think it's like a diet. You need components of protein, carbohydrates, vitamins, etc. And a diet that is too lopsided in one direction uh, or omits the other doesn't work. So I don't think either of us would argue that we just should have applied work and not basic R&D. But if you ask to what degree is our diet out of balance, I don't have any serious question. It's that we overinvest in the R&D side and underinvest in the application. And by invest, I don't mean spend money and actually utilize it. Look, the classic example of the use of technology in military operations to stunning effect is blitzkrieg. The Germans take the new inventions of the 20th century, the combustion engine, the radio, the airplane, communications capabilities, and they make of it this extraordinary innovation operations. But those technologies were available to everybody. It wasn't like the combustion engine or the airplane or whatever weren't known to the French, but they take them and make of them the Maginot Line. So the question I think that's fundamental for us is, are we going to be more like the Germans or more like the French? And at the moment, I think the propensity for error is to be more like the French. I want to uh, run a line from Rory Truex's paper by you. Our model of science has unavoidable vulnerabilities with respect to plagiarism, economic espionage, and other forms of theft. So where exactly then should we draw the line and how much of this should we tolerate for the you know, spillover benefits America gets from having the world's greatest mind study and research here? I don't think there's a straight line answer about how to draw the line. I think it's an art. I just finished a metaphor associated with diet. Let me associate this with cooking or baking. You need to feel your way along in situations and make very practical judgments, and it's an art, not a science, about how much your openness is benefiting you by enabling you to run faster and collaborate better, and for that matter, how much it's benefiting the world through civilian applications versus how much it's advantaging uh, a potential opponent. And that's not just China. It could be Russia. It could be terrorists, etc. And I, I think that's a very difficult judgment that needs to be made in not a general way based on your ideology or your concept, but on a very particular looking at how this particular loaf of bread is rising or not in the oven. Uh, do I pull it out of the oven? Do I keep it in? Do I add salt or not? My sense is you're likely to get many of those judgments wrong, but you just have to muddle through, do the best you can. Uh, so I don't have any magic answer. In my view, America's open society allows it to be very leaky in terms of IP and, and also cybersecurity in some ways. And Russia and China, they're structurally different and they can withstand this a little bit better because they're closed societies. But my feeling is that the open society of the U.S. is the greatest information generating mechanism that's ever existed. So potentially, is not the open society committing to the open society just the best path forward and saying, yes, Chinese are going to steal some of our IP, but in, in the end analysis, we're still moving at that frontier much faster because of our, our open society advantages, and we should recommit to that. Yeah, I think that's probably right. I'm just a little cautious because it's what I want to believe, <laughs> and it's so deep in our own culture. Yeah. But take this interview as, or your podcast in general as an example. We couldn't do this in China. In the course of this, I've criticized not only Xi Jinping, but also Donald Trump, but also it raised some questions about Joe Biden and choices and so forth. And we've talked very candidly about some of the weaknesses in the American military, as well as some of the strengths. We've talked about the risk of warfare with China. All those things are potentially helpful to the Chinese to get a, a rich sense. It's not very useful for them to get a sense of what I think, but they're getting a sense of what the two of you think uh, in regard to these issues. 
and they can be filed away somewhere and so forth against the day when you get appointed to some lofty jobs. So the reality is that we're giving them more information and implicit in a podcast, your effort, is the notion that the benefits outweigh the costs. I think that's a right judgment, but you can imagine some situations in which you'd make a different judgment. And probably some people who you might like to have on your podcast aren't going to come because they're going to be on the other side of that equation. It was reading the uh, your 2018 paper and shouting out America's settled system of governance as something in the U.S.'s favor. When I first read it, I sort of rolled my eyes thinking about, you know, protests in the streets and folks harassing people in the Electoral College and whatnot. Then, you know, if you take a bit of a step back and compare it to the sort of governance challenge that uh, China's going to currently and is continuing to going to continue to up against. It's it's really apples and oranges. No, I think that's right. I think the old proposition from Churchill, that I think it's Churchill, that it's the best of governance systems. It's a terrible governance system, but better than any of the alternatives. Is, is I think it's a very hard system to govern anybody, any society. If you get in your automobile and you drive somewhere, you may think it's a model of efficiency. The fuel is being converted at 30 to 40 percent efficiency, and you're lugging around all these tons of metal to carry your body someplace. Really, in many respects, if you look at the, the waste, the friction, etc., it's really striking. But if you look at the accomplishment, it's pretty astonishing. I think in American government, it's pretty much the same way. There's an awful lot to bemoan, wildly large number of things we could improve does by and large function in good ways and we haven't got much better ways at the moment available to us for improving it. I don't usually like to quote Keynes, but in the long run, we're all dead. And I guess some of my worry is that the Chinese ability to be more risk tolerant, experimental, the IP theft and, and the cyber that they're committing allows them, and the centralization potentially in the short run, allows them to potentially outpace and even if the open society, American values, in the long run are far more stable, far more indicative of success, you know, we might have this short term period over the next decade or two where China is outpacing us. And that does put our national security in, into a hole there. So what do you think about that time differential in terms of what we've just been talking about? I think you're, the thrust of what you're saying is sound, but I would encourage you not to idealize the Chinese. If you look back on uh, our interactions with the Soviet Union, maybe the most common mistakes were overestimating their capabilities, underestimating their difficulties. You look at the Pentagon publications about China and the arguments about the missile gap and the expectations about what the Soviets could accomplish in their military because they were directive and didn't have political constraints and so on and so forth. So in retrospect, we can say the Soviet Union isn't like China. China is vastly more innovative, et cetera. And that's true. But failing in this regard probably is one of our failings probably is that we don't see the problems of our potential adversaries. Just we're at the point right now of the U.S. government getting its head around China where the sort of inputs are likely the the ones that China seem in the in the shiniest way because like our you know intelligence collection is probably at an all time low um, Mandarin language skills are not what the what you know the IC has been recruiting for over the past twenty five years so what you get is a lot of inputs which the Chinese government is trying to put out in the world to make it look like they're scary and you know awesome and fire cylinders right so they're as the U.S. government you know puts more time and money into understanding these issues issues, both on the closed and open side, you'll end up seeing more realistic um, estimations of the things that Richard was talking about earlier of all the sort of nightmares that military civil fusion uh, has to deal with, which we don't necessarily, you know, outside of government have a sense of just because of the sort of information that we're able to look at when trying to evaluate the relative pace of, of progress on these issues. Yeah, I'm glad both of you guys are pushing back against me there. <laughs> I remember just like looking back at Paul Samuelson's uh, principles of economics in the early 60s, 
he he had this book in economics and he showed the growth rates of Soviets versus America. And the Soviets were just going to crush America in the near future. And then he updates this book every few years. And every year he just pushes that off a little bit more. Oh, the Soviets are going to crush us in the future. <laughs> and then it's the 1990s. And he still has that in his book, in his latest version. And it's just, I always think similarly. And I like to put the hope out there for liberal societies. But are we making that same mistake with China? <laughs> yeah, I think that is a very instructive example, Eric. I expected Jordan to ask you, though, when you said that you didn't like to quote Keynes and that you didn't like the PPE system, what it was in your background in high school that led you to these views? <laughs> I spent time as a consultant in OSD Cape, the owner of the PPE, awesome. and then I read everything on the history of it. And so I actually have a book manuscript detailing the history of that and why the PBBE is a Soviet central planning system that has basically ruined the military in my point of view. <laughs> yeah. well, one of the interesting things is how adversaries convert each other in their own images and they become more so we adopted the Soviet five-year plans, etc. There are many examples of that, but the Chinese military is becoming obviously more like us. And we may become more like the Chinese in our being more directive, developing industrial policies, et cetera. So the two sides influence one another in, in that way. I think your book probably has got a good subject there. Because you, you shouted out the, the Chinese intelligence, the, the fact that the Chinese intelligence is going to be listening to this podcast, I feel sort of bad asking you to talk about Averill Haynes. So maybe we'll skip that one and instead close with some novel recommendations. It's the end of the year. People should pick up some fiction. So what's uh, what would you recommend to the listeners of our shows? Oh, good for you. Let me first say that I'm happy to put in a word for Avril because as distinguished from General Austin, I really do know her. She was originally uh, uh, co-director with me of the Supplied Physics Lab project that you described at the beginning of this. And I think she'll really be an excellent director of national intelligence. Is there anything you two disagreed on, on these uh, U.S.-China tech stuff? I don't think so, but I think that's partly because she left the project to do the Biden transition before we, we had to come to grips with writing the paper that Miranda and I wrote. And the editing process, we both were raising questions about other people's papers, and it's easy to agree on those kinds of questions. On the fiction side, I, I think there's a propensity to recommend whatever you read most recently, and there's certainly a lot of good stuff out there recently, but I'll reach back a little further and just try and suggest two or three things that I, I particularly... There's a, a book by Kobo Abe called Woman of the Dunes, which is now largely forgotten. It became a very good movie, but not as good as the book. It's really the great existentialist novel, but that will turn people off and it shouldn't, because uh, it's a real gripping work about a man who goes out on vacation and gets trapped in a community that's constantly digging out sand dunes in Japan. I think it's an important part of thinking about the world to read that book. There's a book by a woman, East European woman, Magda Zabo, called The Door, S-Z-A-B-O, that I like to recommend as a largely unknown thing. And on the subject of unknown things, there's a book by a nephew of the Udalls, a political family, called with a wonderful, engaging title, which I think will appeal to the two of you, uh, called The Lonely Polygamist, about a guy who has uh, four wives, as I recollect. And the challenge of managing him and his 36 or so children, remembering all their names and birthdays and going to the soccer games and so on but how lonely that existence is. It's quite a funny book, but it's also a touching and insightful book. So those are three books that are largely unknown, that are not really unknown, but that people, you and your listeners may not be at all familiar with that I recommend partly because they're so offbeat. Thanks so much for coming on China Acquisition Talk. It's a pleasure. <laughs> You know what it is? Let's go. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh. I've been talking by my own oh shit. Patty, Rosie, what price? Zode, LL, Cool J, Dope shit, Dope shit, Soja, Soja, Ben Roll, 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 Ben Roll,
Many many problems, I got a many nights. Don't go more than I go even low kiss. I'm just not easy. I'm holding on to my time. So you could just fuck with the chill kids. I'm calling like a dress, and everybody choking. I'm holding on to my soul, so they're more young. I'm done with the mouths, so y'all don't come and change. Fashion body, I'm a total. I'm even with the Nike shoes. I'm just a chill son, chill go blue. I'm chill son, full full soon. I can't grab some Nike boots. I'm just a little man, 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 man. I'm just a chill son, chill son. I'm just a little man, 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 man,